uh, Monday evening uh, webinar. The uh, uh, I hope all of you have had a wonderful weekend, and uh, I'd like to share a very interesting to me topic with you today. A little uh, provoke us to think about uh, certain aspects of our own uh, expression of who we are in society and you know, for our personal life, and look out and see what is the state of of society now in general regards to this topic. And I want to talk a little bit about art and its impact, and particularly a certain aspect of that as relates to Master's mission in the world when he, he came. And we know Master came for many different reasons, but uh, he came with a very positive message, which I think is very much needed in this age and very much very important in this age and it's something swami kriyananda emphasized quite a bit as we know if you know of swami's history and if you had a chance to know him he was very very sensitive to art he was uh sensitive in that sense that he had a great enjoyment of, of beauty artistic expression. He himself tried to, to express in artistic ways, but he certainly could, he, he, but he loved beautiful things and he attributed it, his, uh, uh, his appreciation for beauty uh, as subtle astral memories from uh, the astral world. And so it, he could be moved by beautiful music and beautiful artistic uh, expressions of all kinds. And uh, he used to tell this story, but he says, art has more than just, it's just more than just for us personally and our personal enjoyment. Many people just think, oh, I love art, that's beautiful. And it's one of the roles of the artist is to create beauty, to help you know, to other people. But it's also, there's a larger role also of art and also beyond the actual role of art that it's, you might say it's a barometer as well barometer for the individual, but also barometer for society as a whole. Now, there's a story that in this regard that Swamiji used to speak to. And he would say, and it's the story goes that in the old days, ancient times in China, the emperor would wanted to assess how the kingdom is was going he wanted to know what are people happy what are they doing how are things is everything good do i need to do something those sorts of things but because he lived in the capital and he didn't know what was going on in the provinces what he would do he was he would send his envoys to the far reaches of his kingdom and he would give a message to them and he says i want you to go and i want you to listen to the music that is being played, the music that is popular, uh, the music. Uh, and because he felt that a society itself expresses itself, not just individually, but expresses itself the attitude of a community, you might say, the attitude of, a, of a, his kingdom was expressed through the music that was played. And of course, it makes you wonder uh, that what would the emperor think today if the emperor went through the world you go to is 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 how is art expressing itself what what uh, attitudes or or you could say what vibrations are being expressed through artistic expression today i don't know painting sculpture poetry theater dance uh and of course you have to look i think in today you know maybe art is in the previous time was that there was a more classical expression, but today you have the popular expression too, which is now very much because of media. You've got movies, you've got television, you probably got you got WeChat, you've got you've got everything, or or uh, WhatsApp, and you've got uh, all of the various popular mediums that are also expressing uh, or have artistic expression in them as well. So you have to ask. What's being expressed there is reflecting the state of mind on a larger scale. And uh, you could see, and 
you could wonder, you know, and this is Swamiji, of course, who is uh, sensitive to art. He would he would shake his head and he would say <laughs> some of the trends say in it mildly were not as not so good. And art has a special place and they have a special function, artists do in society. Uh, they express feelings, they, they're evoc it's evocative, but they, and it's of course, we think of art, the individual artist, he's expressing or she is expressing herself. And art is often think about why do you do art? It's art for art's sake. And it is that to some degree on the individual level, but also artists are sensitive in that way. An artistic temperament is associated with, with someone who is a little bit sensitive. In other words, one who can feel and has that ability to express those feelings in a way, either individually or, or with, through their craft, if you think of it like that, in a larger way. And it is sort of, you could sort of say it, that phrase that Paramahansa Yogananda used to use, he said, thoughts are universally, not individually rooted. So you think, is the, in, is the individual artist just merely creating art? Or are they channeling art? In other words, art, there's something in the ether itself that the artist has a sensitivity to feel that and express that. And they could be quite individual and much of art is simply individual subconscious art. They're coming through being filtered through a person's individual subconsciousness or individual experience. But there's also a larger dimension also. And the artist or you might say the, the greater artists have the ability to express collective feelings as well. Feelings that not just arise in the subconscious or filtered through the subconscious that you say, but are super conscious. And so the universality of a thought or a feeling or an attitude going through an individual. And if a person is expressing it through the superconscious, then there's a, this is the realm of the great artists who have the ability to inspire and who's in great numbers and whose work is considered timeless because it's, it's been coming from a higher plane rather than their own individual subconsciousness. And there's a wonderful book that, uh, interesting book, I would say more, uh, Conversations with Great Composers that uh, was written maybe a hundred years ago, maybe more, that uh, the individual there, the author interviewed great artists, classical artists of that time. And I think Brahms and those sorts of composers. And they all seemed to say this. They said, yes, how do you create art? And, and the person being interviewed said, well, it comes through me. It's, I don't create the art. I channeled, I chant out of the music. I channel that something passes through me and that comes from a higher dimension. And that's the realm of the great artists. The lesser ones, you might say, they try to create it from their own individual level of where their consciousness is, which generally, as I say, is mostly from a subconscious level. But the artist has always been throughout history to some degree, the great artists particularly, there's a certain aspect of divinity there. And they've been, because one, especially if they have craft talent to be able to express something well, it's a notch above the ordinary. And so there's been a certain reverence for the artists and the support for the arts in classical times, the kings and the Queens, they would they would sponsor the great artists because they and then the artists would express some universal theme uh, on behalf of them and also on behalf of the society as a whole. And they were recognized in that way. There's something special about them. They have a gift. Now, anybody, of course, who has a gift has also some responsibility for that gift. Isn't it so? I mean, even us as individuals 
<laughs> whatever our level is or whatever our level, even in our daily actions, we have responsibility for our actions. We do something and just because, oh, I want to be, as I heard somebody say just recently, I, whatever I do, I just want to be sincere. Well, you know, perfectly sincere in anything I do. And, and I thought, well, that's good. That's good. But yet, what are we being sincere about? And the artist, you hear that, I want to be sincere with my art. Well, you can be sincere with negative attitudes and very sincerely negative. And that's, it's, so it's not enough just to be a good artist and channel something well, crafted well. There's a certain responsibility and the responsibility to, if not, we don't think societally, we think individually because we put something out and there's a certain karma there, isn't there? isn't there anything we do has karmic ramifications and our own consciousness when we express as our individuality our life in the world at large we have to take responsibility for that and what we do bounces back and reinforces our own attitudes and so there's so art does that on a larger level as well and so the artist has that ability you could say that special ability to be able to invoke feelings individually nice painting you go see it and you just feel uplifted but there's also and that's an aspect so let's take popular art movies television things that are things that are in the media around us those things have have power we know that they have a power to move people they have a power to influence people's attitudes and so there has to be some responsibility there on the behalf of whoever is creating something and some people dismiss that idea but nevertheless i think it's it's uh more important than that not to just dismiss and so we have to ask ourselves what am i invoking through my own individual life and so take responsibility to that and also the artist i would hope take some responsibility but whether or not they do there is also in art that we look and see what what art is like and what's happening in art today in society that goes beyond just the individual because uh art is an expression as the emperor in china was saying it's an expression of societal attitudes things that are happening in society so the question here is you might be asking why am i bringing up this subject well <laughs> it's it uh if you were at the book fair attending online book fair over the recent weekend i spoke to something how master came to incarnate in this age he came with a message he came with many missions and it applies on all different levels and one of those missions was to uplift society his whole mission you might be thinking you might think of as an expression of art and uh he brought at a at a time when society seems to be uh being dominated by certain trends and attitudes he brought a positive message that was an intentional part of his mission and why he and other the ma other masters came when he did and and i say this because there is a certain attitudes in society that perhaps we're not even consciously aware of there's uh, and they're philosophical they have a philosophical context that i'd like to mention and in the philosophical tradition, there's a tradition of philosophy and an approach to life, which is called nihilism. Now, nihilism is not a common word. Most people don't use it in their vocabulary, and a lot of people don't even know what it is. But it's a manifestation, it's a characteristic way of approaching life that has taken root and particularly in modern society for lots of different real not lots of different reasons and it's important to understand this and especially if we have influence in society but certainly 
influence within ourselves. And I think Master's mission was to counter this trend. And I'd like to define, I'll, I'll read some definitions here of nihilism so that we understand what it is I'm speaking to. And a definition here, these are dictionary uh, definitions. It says, nihilism is a philosophy that rejects general or fundamental aspects of human existence such as subjective truth, knowledge, morality, values, or meaning. In other words, that, in that definition, there's no, there's no objective truth. There's no truth at all. It's all relative, you might say. There's no sanat and dharma. I mean, that's just one person's conception of what this world is about. There's nothing fundamental. It's subjective. There's, not a, there's nothing objective. Now we know this reality is to some degree that we, it is not as we seem, but to say that there's no underlying meaning, there's no underlying value or direction or purpose is to take it too far. And it may not be obvious to us, but to say that it's meaningless is another matter altogether. And this is one of the characteristics of nihilism that Life is, has no meaning, it has no purpose, and therefore many consequences come from, come from that, as I'll explain in another definition here. And another definition is nihilism is the belief that all values are baseless. Again, this is from the dictionary, and that nothing can be known or communicated. In other words, everything is subjective. Nothing can be really known because nothing real, there is no reality. It can, so you can't communicate it. And to go on, it is often associated with extreme pessimism and a radical skepticism that condemns existence. A true nihilist could believe in nothing, have no loyalties, no purpose other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. And this actually uh, was and is, has continued to be prevalent in certain movements today, and it's certainly in the past. The Russian Revolution arose out of the uh, influence of a strong nihilistic philosophical background in, in those days. And you go back to Nietzsche and the German uh, philosopher and others who followed him, Jacobi, which who the inspired it was philosophy inspired, inspiring the uh, French Revolution. These trends began to come in the 19th century into the early 20th century for a lot of different reasons, which we can explore. And finally, one final one here that applies a little bit more to what we see going on in society today. Third definition is nihilism is holding that existing social, holds that existing social and political institutions must be destroyed in order to clear the way for a new state of society and, and employing extreme measures, including terrorism and assassination. Now, well, that's pretty grim, don't you think? And, if, and But you can see it playing out. ISIS, for example, today, they don't seem to have a positive vision of future. It, it's an emphasis on terrorism and destruction, taking down the world order. And of course, you look back, this is this was the Bolshevik resolution in Russia had an undertone of that. Now, there are positive uh, messages or hopes expressed in any social movement, uh, an ideal utopia in the future, perhaps, being one of them. But the emphasis is on the negative in a nihilistic outlook. And if you were to, there, I, there's a word, it's a bit of a you know, new word, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, in artistic movement today, in literature, uh, youth leader literature particularly, which is unfortunately, but particularly, and also in uh, movies, it's called grimdark. It's a, it's a way of describing attitudes, the modern attitudes, a grim dark. It's, in the, it's grim and it's dark. The popularity in modern, much, some modern literature, I don't want to overstate this, but some 
uh, modern artistic movements of the future is grim. So it's characterized by very grim, dark uh, tones. And in literature, the fascination that you find in certain genres of literature of dystopia. Dystop the future is everything's falling apart. And you can see this sort of dis this pessimism sometimes expressed, even in popular culture, everything's bad, everything's grim, and the future is no good. And what is the result of that? An attitude, you have an attitude such as that, and there's a certain sense of despair, certain uh, a pessimistic, despairing look toward the future. In the individual, it's depressing. And you find there is, a, you can get into that darkness and it does lead to consequences and this is what we and artist art is a medium that can express this particularly what you have now i wouldn't say high fine art necessarily expresses that so much but certainly in popular art the mediums that influence people now you you might say well i'm overstating this but yet Movements in society, they may not be conscious, but underneath, attitudes express themselves on in the individual. People don't know why they have a certain attitude, why they do certain actions, but there are certain deep, subtle forces within them that they have chosen to associate with. And I would, they're, they're negative, they're negative, and society is influenced as well by that in, in different ages, different things have motivated societies in certain directions. And I think we have to take this responsibly. And now what does this have to do with us? Well, we're part of that society and each of us are artists in our own way. Now, I think you could look for the cause to this societally and you might, you might think, oh, this is a Western, you know, this is a Western philosophical tradition. But believe me, everything that happens today, we're a world society today. Do you remember when Swami, he once said, he was asked, you know, he had come to India in the 1950s, early 60s. And then he came back, he visited India many times, but he came back and stayed in India in the 2003 it was and stayed in India much of his life after that, going back and forth. And he was asked by a person, oh, Swamiji, you were here in India back in, in 30, 40 years ago. Have you seen any change? You used to meet lots of saints in those days. Do you see those saints today? And Swami said, no, I don't. And I have seen a change. There seems to be much less spirituality in India today in the 21st century than what I saw 40 years ago. Saints seem to me to be more common, or at least he ran into them, he crossed his path crossers. And the, the person he was speaking with had a bit of a, you know, it was that wasn't a popular thing to say. But Swami said, but it's okay. It's okay. The rise of materialism has been very dramatic in India over the last half century since its independence from Great Britain, uh, the U. And he said, but it's necessary and it's only a phase. And that rise in materialism has greatly impacted the West and has led to a lot of suffering. He says, it perhaps would to some degree in India too, but India has an underlying strata of religious belief and spirituality and faith that will resist it in the long run. He says, but it does go through, it is going through a time of great material growth. And he says, this is necessary for India to take its place in the world. But he says, but it's temporary. But nevertheless, it does have an influence. And in the West, of course, it's had a tremendous influence. And some of the, you find it's the rise of science, which is a necessary thing. Again, this is somewhat of a necessary phase because we're moving from one age into another age. And the rise of science is correlated with the decline of 
spiritual religion or traditional religion, let me say, traditional ritualistic religion in the West. People no longer are satisfied with belief. They want something more, but what do they have to believe in? That's the problem. Positive alternatives have been few and far between. And art serves a function, you might say, to give a positive alternative, to inspire as the traditional role of art has been. But at the same time, art is powerful and it can have a role that can also depress. And you could say, well, it's merely reflecting the attitudes of the age. Well, that's true. But to merely reflect is not great art. Great art also inspires. And I think it has all artists to whatever degree have a responsibility and all of us to some degree also must consider ourselves to be artists. We're artists of our own life. And we have the ability merely to reflect what's going on around us. But don't we also have a responsibility to be great artists in that sense of, in the sense that of being a channel that actually inspires and gives a positive direction and not your merely reflects trends. And although nihilism is particularly a philosophy that seems to, it's been, I mean, it's not, you go back in history and you can find, so it's nothing new in this world. It just manifests in a little more strongly within over the last few centuries. But history is like a wave. You know, there's a beginning of the wave, then there's the, you know, the top of the wave and then the bottom end of the wave. And I, I think these waves appear in, world, in the world and they have to appear somewhere. A wave of consciousness appears and perhaps that wave is struck because the, the science in the West first, because the rise of modern science, not ancient science, we know there were past waves, but modern waves of material science seems to have hit the shores of human consciousness in the West first. But that wave is now passing throughout the entire world, the higher part of that wave. And so the world as a whole is influenced by a materialistic uh, consciousness. This world, you could say one of the, some of the characteristics you might say of it, of that wave is uh, that as core, it's not, science isn't at fault, you might say. It, it's just science is what it is. Material science is what it is, but it does have an impact. And see, you see, science answers the question of what looks at this reality, says, what is this reality? And, and also tr it tries to explore what, how, what is it? How did it get this way? How, what is, why is this, what is this universe? How did this universe come into existence? But science really doesn't answer the question of why. Is there a purpose? You see, science can't answer that. And that, as, as it's knocked out the pillars of traditional ritualistic religion, it also has knocked out that foundation a little bit of what is the purpose of this life in general? Is there a direction? Evolution is, seems to be working, but you could say there's no purpose to any of it. And a life without purpose is grim. And there is a, if you have a chance, there's a very one, a good book to read. I was going to say wonderful, but that's overstating. It's a good book. And uh, it was by Viktor Frankl. Uh, uh, what was the title? And he wrote about, he was in a concentration camp in World War II. And he wrote about uh, the necessity in life for meaning, the search for meaning. And he noticed in his experience in concentration camp that some survived better than others. And those who lost the sense of purpose, there's no, they, they gave up because it's, it, was, it was a grim environment all around. Those who seemed to be able to survive better than others were those who could find purpose in life. Now, Viktor Frankl, he was an inmate too, and he had been a psychologist. And so he was a, 
attuned to these sorts of things. And so he spent his time in the concentration camp trying to give meaning in any way possible. You know, when a person, one fellow inmate wanted to give up, and was just going to let it go and give up his life and succumb. And, but he would say to him, you have a daughter, right? She's, she, and her daughter was free, was uh, elsewhere in another country with, uh, in, a, in the UK, I believe. Think of her. Wasn't that going to be nice when you see her again? Live for her. Another, there was another fellow scientist who had, uh, he encouraged, he says, remember those insights, those papers that you were going to write before the war started? You never had a chance to do them. Soon, when this war's over, you can write those, you can express those, and, and, and whatever, these very simple ways, he would go and inspire each individual according to their need in life, trying to give them some sense of purpose to hold on to. I'm going to live for this. And he then, from this, expanded it into a larger, you could say, a philosophy of psychology is the search for meaning. And life without meaning is, is grim, dark. And, but it's the purpose, you could say, of religion. Sometimes people might say it's a philosophy, metaphysics, to answer the question, not of what and how, which is the realm of material science, but of why. That's what science can't answer. And so because it cannot answer that, you could say it's subjective, it dismisses it and say, well, there is no why. And the consequence of that gives rise because it's an impulse within every individual to want to know why. We ask the question, why is this universe here? Why am I born? Why do I have the troubles that I have? Why, why did that happen or this happen? It's a natural impulse of the soul to ask why, but science can't answer that in the macro sense. And so we fill it. Other things, there's other consequences. And that's the realm of materialism. I search for happiness, as Master said, the eternal quest for happiness that's within the human soul or the, av the avoidance of suffering. And so you find the rise of hedonism. I'll find my meaning through pleasure. Since nothing matters, why not just enjoy ourselves, pleasure and the senses? You have hedonism as a expression, and you see this in modern society. You see it expressed in art also. As you could see it, or you find gives rise to a secular spirituality. Humanism has a lot of value of true, but humanism places man at the center of the universe, and which seems logical, maybe. You know, there's nothing else exists, so man is the center, my happiness my fulfillment. Well, it's certainly better than nothing, but it takes God out of the equation. God is the center of the universe, if we truly understand, not man. And so you have careerism. My career is the meaning. My family is the meaning of my life. There's, uh, you know, as I mentioned, physicalism, the spirit, scientific materialism, everything is physical. Secularism, only the temporal universe of the ordinary sense ex uh, experiences is real. And so these sorts of ways of thinking, they have an expression, they, a general malaise, you might say, a sense of meaninglessness can be expressed in despair, pointlessness. Now I'm overstating this that people say, well, I don't necessarily feel that way. And it's true, not everybody succumbs to this. And it's not even conscious all the time on a society, but you see trends like the emperor was looking for and expressed through artistic expression. And if you listen to popular music, it, you know, popular music has its, it just makes us happy maybe, and it's a catchy tune, but also it also expresses a certain shallowness also. It doesn't, it does it inspire. Now some music actually does, even popular music can be very inspirational inspirational in the sense of expansive, not just inspirational of a good feeling, a sense of real expansion, spiritual expansion. And that is the, that is the goal of art. And I would hope 
that that ideal is there in everyone who's an art and e artist and each of us are artists in our own way now i person you may be thinking oh i got to be thinking of grand uh, grand uh, purposes when i i do a little drawing I, i'm not going that far but on a societal level when we add it all up there are some of us who do have potential to move other people greatly. Swami tried to embody this in his music and whatever he did, his, even his, his writing, his, even his speaking, every, whatever he did, he saw that there's a responsibility to the individual to try to uplift. And we begin by uplifting ourselves because our outward expression is just but a reflection of what's going on within each one of us. And so you find, and I don't want to criticize positive outward alternatives. I guess I am criticizing a little bit, only to the degree that there's a limitation. They're not the end. And so you can find, I mentioned humanism and environmentalism, the, the, the wish for a, a utopia in this world. There is no utopia in this world. But underneath them, there's a certain ideal. And even when Swamiji started cooperative communities he said you know he said people say oh we're going to create the perfect community he says there's no such thing as the perfect community it's just that some ways are a little bit better than other ways that they create a an environment to allow us to do as individual what we really want to do to find god he says we have to go back to the true purpose and this is what's you know, the, you might say secular religions, you know, uh, self-actualization, you might say, or even even things, if I reduce all stress in my, my life, then I'll be happy. Uh, hatha yoga, if I make a, if I'm if done simply for a good healthy body, all of these things, they're good but they're limited. And so we need to, if, if there's the foundation has to be there for all of these movements to find their potential and be seen as channels to something higher. And so I'm not, we don't want to throw out good things. What we're saying is let's take the good things, good movements in this world, but let's underpin them with something that's solid that's going to take us in a direction. Life has meaning and purpose. It's enough, it's not enough to just say that. We have to be able to supply that purpose in whatever way we can. And we can't really do that unless we find that individually. The artist, we as the artist must discover that substrata of what is the purpose of life? What's the purpose of my life? What meaning do I find in, in my life? And if it's only despair, then we're going to express that to some degree. And our lives certainly are not going to be moving in a direction toward fulfillment or happiness. So we have that responsibility to ourselves. But I'm thinking also societally, we have that. And this is what I think my uh, opinion is one of the missions of our masters was to awaken these fundamentals within every individual, but also to, to societally in a larger frame, provide a framework of purposefulness in this world to show that life does have a purpose. There is meaning, there is direction, and there is a pathway for each individual to be able to discover that for themselves. You can't just announce it. You have to then also give people tools to be able to accomplish and walk that path. So master, his gurus, they provided a message of Sanatan Dharma and brought tools to be able to allow that to be within the uh, society as a whole. And whereas before we look to God on the altar, you might say societally through religion, we place flowers on the altar that God is out there, God's in the sky. 
but that message was encapsulated the real that master brought it's encapsulated in that phrase in the bible neither neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold the kingdom of god is within you so it's an ancient message that's what christ said the kingdom of god is within you and the time now is for us to discover that kingdom and master brought the keys to that kingdom through various techniques but techniques need also an underpinning of philosophy and worldview in order to understand why are we doing these things what's the direction what's the pathway and i think that applies to us individually but also there's an important message here for society as a whole and he master came to provide you could say an antidote to the disease of despair and he provided hope in other words possibility of bliss and i know when i read that autobiography that was the message i came away i didn't understand it but i felt hope because i looked back and i was wandering i didn't i was looking for something i couldn't find it and of course if you look and you look and you look and you can't find something it, inevitably you become despairing oh it's helpless i'm hopeless i can't find it but Thank God I was brought to that message of the masters. That there, and I felt that's what I felt, hope. Then it was up to me to take it the next step and do something about it. That love is the answer to despair. Love is the answer to a purposeless existence. When we love, and I think that must be, I wonder those fellows that are terrorists, those guys, remember those guys coming in that boat into Mumbai, what was that, 15 years ago, or whatever it was, did they feel love? Because if you love, and you really know love, you know there's a purpose to love. You're not going to be a terrorist and callously approach life in that way, no matter what your underlying philosophy might be. You're going to love. Bliss in motion is the way Swami described that, described love. And in love, we understand life's purpose. Love, even on the individual level, it gives meaning to life. And in the embrace of love, you could say, how is despair possible? Even it's on the individual level, even human, human love is just but a spark of something more divine. And from purpose, if you have it, comes action an inspiration to put something in motion uh, uh, that idea of fighting against darkness this is i mean this is in even in the bhagavad gita this idea is expressed the idea of fighting against darkness while clinging clinging to that idea that there's something that spans all and that's something greater and this idea expands all ages in all cultures and ex ex expressed in literature and epics in great art that aspiration that that quest of the individual soul for meaning and uh i think this is what and what uh we need to encourage in the future and, and i'm happy to say i think and the positives here not to i don't want to leave anybody in despair but i think all of these things are passing these passing fads because like i was saying when before i found master through the autobiography i was in a somewhat of a state of despair and what that i think that state of despair of because i couldn't find meaning draws to it answers and i think each individual you find artists now this grim dark literature it's just a cry in the darkness it's crying for something and it's a it's an expression that i want something and god responds to the individual if we cry the mother comes and helps us and i think that that is coming and you find that every movement in whatever direction stimulates a counter movement in reverse and so that grim dark you might say movement is inspiring a counter movement of, of another generation come say wait a minute wait a minute there's hope also 
And I think you're going to see this rebound in the decades ahead, even expressed in art, an effort. People say, I don't, because it doesn't bring us happiness. I don't want that. You know, I can only wallow in darkness for so long until you start saying, I've got to get up and do something positive. I got to go out into the sun. You know, I can't just be sitting here in the darkness. And you'll, I predict at least, that we'll begin to see the stirrings of that in the years to come here. And in, uh, in out of perhaps the difficulties, whatever it is that the world is going through with terrorism and these sorts of things. Maybe even this COVID is a, just a, an expression of darkness that takes form in this fashion. Out of darkness will come light. It's there already, but we perhaps don't see it, but it'll begin to spring forth. And I think it'll come forth, particularly through the artists. You see, because art, when in a popular, popular art as well as classic, the artists are drawing on and they see on a subtler level, each one individually and then collectively. I think you'll begin to see a trend begin to develop that counters the popularity of darkness. Something positive will start to come. A generation maybe needs to pass, maybe two generations, who knows. But I think that ultimately will be the case. So take these thoughts, please take them and I hope to see you again next Monday. If you have any questions, again, like always, put them in the chat box and Barra will pass them on to me. And so uh, I, I might look there. It says, what do we do if our meaning of life clashes with your birth? And <laughs> uh, you know, that's a very particular situation. And I'm not going to answer that today, but I do appreciate the question because I might weave that in that question there, if you see it in the chat box, I try to weave it in into a future discussion. So God bless all of you. Joey to you.